right. All right. Um, I guess I'll just give mine. So my thing is I'm a little bit more um, sensible, right? And trying to understand why certain perspectives ent enter into the conversation and why people draw certain conclusions, right? So in unpacking open theism, uh, I was trying to say it earlier, but I'll just summarize it. Uh, it's the fact that you had some theologians that sort of this revival to try and put the text back in this ancient Near Eastern perspective. And in doing so, they actually stripped some of the uniqueness of the text, right? Um, but the objective was to, uh, if you look at it against its ancient Near Eastern background, uh, the text has a lot of similarities to other cultures, right? The difference is the text was not written monolithically by one author, right? You know that the spirit inspired it, but different authors wrote and contributed to uh, what we call the Bible today, right? Which means um, there are certain glimpses of the divine based on a perspective of the author, um, but cohesively, right? We see the thread of the spirit trying to push us towards uh, the character of, of Yah, um, and why he deserves worship, right? That's why they had to actually start out with the book of Bereshit of Genesis to show that, you know, our existence, we owe it to him as creator. Um, him being the creator actually affects uh, this open theism because as a creator deity, especially in the ancient Near East, um, you are supreme over the creation, right? For the most part, unless you endow other things that you create with the same capabilities as yourself, right? And in that case, they can vie for your throne and they can usurp your throne. Um, a lot of times it's based on um, additional skill sets that the other gods may have. But in Israelite culture, it's very distinct that the throne is never vied for. We never see any other deity vie, vie for the throne of the created deity of the text, right? The patron deity of the text. And if he created things and he created it, um, without our reality in existence, meaning that it's not like he came about within our human experience, right? He didn't come about that way. Matter of fact, this is a teacher of the Mormons, right? Mormons teach that man could become God and, and we're gonna be like God was, right? Meaning that you go to a transitionary stage that you start off with a human experience, right? And then you ascend to Godhood, right? So now when you do certain things, right? It's gonna be from that perspective because that is your Genesis, that is your origin. Well, this deity did not was not did not come about that way. When the text opens up, he already is there, right? Nothing is begetting him. He is not coming for anything. Matter of fact, the authors don't even care about that. What they're just trying to show is why he is preeminent because he has created all things, and that no other deity has ever vied for his throne. So there's something distinct about his relationship with the creation, where he can put things in motion, right? Because he has a foreknowledge of things. And again, we got to. I guess next time we talk, I can kind of better define that term for knowledge. But when you understand that he has created all things and all things are subject unto him, like it says in the book of 1 Corinthians 15, um, then that means that he has authority and not only authority, he can turn the will of things. See him turn the will of Pharaoh, right? Harden Pharaoh's heart, let it go. Harden Pharaoh's heart, let it go, right? Even our will sometimes he can intervene and change our will. That goes to show his sovereignty over his creation, right? If you don't have sovereignty over your creation or anything that's created under your power, I mean, you don't know the laws that you have put in face, the laws of physics, right? That, that means the deity don't know the laws of physics. So he may anticipate something that may not happen because he miscalculated physics. How was that? Like that, the fact that he's creator it affects that entire open theistic perspective. And this is one of the major counterpoints that's made to open theism is the concept of creation. The last thing I end off and say is that um, the, the ultimate thing that we have to understand when we unpack this thing, if we really truly want to understand it, is I, I, my perspective just to refrain from certain dogmatic stances um, that's absolute until we have a final ruling on it or a final understanding on it. Um, like for example, I would be open to hear, you know, somebody give their position or like that, that, that guy, Christopher, unfortunately I didn't have a one-on-one -on -one with him because I had like a hundred questions I can ask him because I'm familiar with the position. Um, but unfortunately Berean for whatever reason does not allow me to really talk that much on his platform, but that's neither here nor there. But I just wanted the people to see the perspective of open theism, what it answers. Anytime you see a new paradigm emerge, it's trying to address something that it feels has been glossed over that has been overlooked 
and the nuance hasn't been unturned, right? So when you understand why they approach the text that way and what is the agenda of the group that is actually coming out with this theological framework, then you know how to address it appropriately, right? Then you know its shortcomings, its vulnerabilities, right? Places where it needs to be refined. Um, and that's why I was asking Kevin G, um, and again, I don't know how thoroughly he has studied it, but again, anybody that's interested in it, I have tons of books on this thing. I can send them to you if you want. Um, but the, the main premise that I landed here is that we just have to understand what drove this understanding. And it's the fact that if a God knows the future, you cannot have a genuine relationship with the creation if you know the future. If you know everything that's gonna happen between now and whenever the end of the world is, how can you have a genuine relationship with your creation? Because it's not gonna be genuine if you know. If you know already and, you, and to the point where it supersedes experience, then it's not genuine. It's not authentic. Well, well, uh, Brother Divine, I, I disagree with that because I think that because God knows all, he knows your decisions before you make it, right? Like I have free will. I can decide to cross the street right now. He knows I'm going to do it. He been knew I was going to do it. That doesn't negate my free will, right? So we we live as free will individuals, even though he knows everything that's going to happen, which is why he he had his son sacrificed from the foundation of the world. No, right? so I, so I I I'm in acquiescence with you, and I wasn't saying this as this as if it's my position. I'm simply trying to present it objectively so that way we can take a look at it and see if that is the core principle driving it, what are the vulnerabilities, right? Like, like yeah, I, was, I, I right? understood that you made that yeah. clear and I appreciate it because at first I thought you were talking about you, but you were talking about- Oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I would just like, I would just land it out objectively yeah. because like I said, once you understand what drives it, then you look for vulnerabilities. Like I said, I work in IT, I'm a solutions engineer. So my job is look at the architecture, whatever platform that the company I'm working for is selling and be able to understand it inside out and know the choke points, the vulnerabilities, et cetera, and then make suggestions on how to fine tune it. Well, sometimes I have to reverse engineer. Sometimes we're given a, pro a competitor's product and we have to see, well, how come this product is more efficient than ours, right? And again, because I'm not the developer of the actual item, I have to reverse engineer. So when I hear people saying certain things, I'm creating a profile. And once that profile is generated, I try to match it against something that I may already know, like open theism. So let's say they didn't, they didn't never mention the term open theism, but they kept throwing out these parts. Then I would ask a question, hey, do you believe that if God has foreknowledge, will that affect a genuine relationship with his creation? And then just stand back and watch them jump on that because you'll see, okay, this is what they're promoting. This is what they push it. Okay. And then now once you identify it, you know, the exact questions that ask them to show the people why it falls short. And I'm gonna add, I wanted to end it off by just saying my position I mentioned earlier is a posteriori and a priori. And, and when we think about the most high, he has knowledge without experience. And then he has knowledge with experience. It is a, a, a being that is extremely unique that we don't see like anything else in the ancient Near East, right? Because he can declare a thing and know it will happen. He can tell you something that's going to happen before it happens. Hence why he told the Israelites in the book of, of Isaiah, don't go to the other, do what the Babylonians do, go to the enchanters and the diviners. Why would you go to them to seek what I'm about to do? You got to come and get to know your God, right? So he, he knows all of these things, but his experience he has not experienced it yet until the actions happen, until he acts on a thing, until he puts the things in motion according to his plan. And then it's at that point we see this. Now I know because this shows his deity is now intimate with his creation, which is distinct from what we see in other quote unquote religions and other cultures. He not only does he interact with the creation, but he feels for it. Can I ask you a question, Brother Divine? Of uh, course, can. We was talking about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19 before, and how we see, you know, the most high uh, come down and, and uh, you know, uh, they meet him at the gate with the uh, two angels. And, you know, we see to me the, the, the I guess the, the view that I see is similar to what we see with the Greek pantheon and the relationship of how they would come down amongst humans. And same thing what we see with the underworld and the abyss and all these type of things. Would, mm -hmm. would you say that uh, the Most High uses some of that to give us a perspective, you know, across cultures and times and everything uh, to show how he, like you were saying before, 
intermingle with his creation because we see that it was the Lord and two angels, right? And he actually sat down and ate with them. What's your thoughts on that? I'm just curious. That's and that's phenomenal because typically um deities don't sup with their creation in ancient Greece. That is why food offerings are given, right? It's a way of you parsing aside a meal and putting it on a shrine and devoting it to the deity so the deity can eat. And then, then after you you pray and give you know your your thanksgiving to the deity, then you pr proceed to eat your meal, right? And then that which is left over, either you discard it or you can eat it as well. That's the concept in the ancient Near East as far as feeding deities. We very rarely see a deity come to earth and sup with a being that he has covenant with. That's we see them eat in the in their in their realm, but to come down and to sup and to eat with Abraham is very profound. And something that if you lived in an ancient Near East and you was to hear this, you know, from another culture about Israel, about this guy, you're like, whoa, what? He actually came and, and sat and ate with you? Like, our guys don't do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I got to continue to take bits and pieces of my cornbread and all of that and put it aside to feed them. You know what I'm saying? So so this is the, the, the genuineness of this deity, that he can come from a lofty place and not just interact with the creation for his own purposes and will but also to be sensible to the creation. Hence why when he was having the discussion with the other angels and Abraham heard, Abraham intervened. And Abraham spoke about the situation and Abraham pleaded, if you find 50 righteous, will you? And the deity, guess what? He hearkened unto his wishes. This is profound. So when people talk about open theism, if you simply speak on it from the perspective of the ancient Aries, because again, that's common in the ancient Aries, open theism. But when you look at this text, there are so many things that are happening that is unique. It is not pure open theism at all. It's not, you know, and, and that's just my take on it. So that wouldn't negate God's being all knowing, all powerful, omnipotent. Right. Uh, just because he came down in human form and he was like, well, if you find two, if you find 10, if you, you know, that whole uh, that, you know, discussion that was going on between them, will you save the city? Right. Because, I mean, you know, he already knew. I think the whole thing was a communication uh, style or novelist style or ancient Near East style of communicating to, uh, you know, us. Uh, what do you think of that? No, I agree because there was a purpose why this text was written. It wasn't simply just to record the life of the gods. See, like in other religions, a text is written to record a history of the gods and their lifestyles, their livelihoods, right? This is why you hear so many different epics about these gods and you learn about their character through their interactions in their realm, right? Before there's any human interaction. We don't see that in regards to the deity uh, of the scriptures. Anytime we see him in the throne room, there's, there's never a full on episode with him doing something there, like walking to an angel and having a personal conversation with an angel and, you know, get mad and do something like we don't see that. The text does not give that. Whenever you see these things in the ancient Hebrews, it would be a red flag. Like, wait, why, why is this God not doing that? Like, that's how we learn about the character and nature of our gods. Right. But this text being written in the way it was written, wasn't concerned with the deities interactions in the supernatural realm, but his intimate interactions in the earthly realm. And it was written in hindsight. Check it out. When the book of Genesis was written, nobody contemporary was alive when these events were being recorded. Moshe, we believe that he's the author of this. He wrote this after the fact, right? So he's writing in retrospect, which is interesting because if that's the case and the Most High chose Moshe to capture this, writing in retrospect is to teach us something about the deity. It's much different than other literature that you find in ancient East. And matter of fact, if we have this conversation again as a follow-up, I would love to bring some sources. I'm doing also off the dome, but bring some sources to kind of unpack it and show you how unique this deity is in regards to his relationship with his creation and space and time. Now, the question, I'm going to ask you this again, bro. The question is this is, when God tested Adam, was the test to know basically what was in Adam's heart. Correct. 
Oh, you just I, felt I, a I, trap. G Con just I, set a trap for you. Well, a big I'm gonna mute my mic, bro. No, no, no. What he's trying to what he's trying to say, he's trying to twist it. I know what he's trying to say, and he's trying to twist because he's trying to say, like, God is trying to search the heart and figure out what he's got going on. It's not again, yeah. it is not for us. Y'all knows the whole the beginning from the end, but just well, like just my, said that no, what, big, big red, let me give you an alley oop, right? Go to go to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 11. G Con are the hearts of man open or closed before Yah? Uh, yeah, the hearts of man is open before God. Okay, so if it's um, open, do you have to search for it? Is yeah, it's open to search. I can go. I can walk in the door and still uh, search for something. Wait, what? Yeah, I can walk in the door and still search for something. Okay, so in ancient times, when a book is open, what did that represent? A passageway, basically. So I'll give you an example. Uh, when the um, the angel was speaking to the prophet Daniel. Um, and told him about the book that the book was closed. What does that represent when a book is open? When a book is closed, the content the contents is uh, is not revealed. It's closed. There you go. But when it's open, it's revealed. Correct. Right. So okay. So, so okay. read read that big red real quick if you got it. And I'm gonna get to you Isaiah five. Everything you're saying, G. Proverbs. Kind of heard what this again? Before. So I'm gonna address it. No, no, not you. Uh, big red. I asked him to read Proverbs, Proverbs chapter fifteen. Proverbs fifteen Long. and eleven. Read that. 15 11 hell mm -hmm. and destruction are before the lord how much more than the hearts of the little or the children of men Char the hearts of the children of men are always open before yah he does not have to in a sense seek it what is what does it mean when we say search my heart remember the person that is uh that is asking the question or the one that is um i would say yielding to a greater power to search them is not the most high it is the author asking the most high to perform the action, right? He's asking him to search his heart, right? So we have to look at it from that perspective. And I, and I want to be with you on this, Econ, because, you know, I'm not here to misrepresent your position. I just have some questions to ask, just like you ask us questions, to see what side of the fence on open theism that you fall on. Are you are you familiar with uh, Clark H. Pennock's work? Uh, no, no, theism. I'm not familiar with his work. He's I'm one of the so forerunners and pioneers. Yeah. Actually, you should study him because he's actually a professor emeritus of Hebrew and Old Testament, right? So what, what I laid out earlier for them when we was talking was that the objective was to put the text back in his ancient Eastern background, right? The problem with that is there are things or themes, what we call a motif, that exists in the text, what we call the Bible, that is unique, that actually removes it out of its ancient Near Eastern context. Now, some people will say, well, that's because at some time in the future it was redacted, et cetera. But no, th this was a unique perspective that these people through their process of ethnogenesis created, right? So let me give you an example so you can see what I'm talking about. And when you read Isaiah chapter five, what kind of literary genre is that? See, this is what I need you to understand because I think you take things too literal and that's a problem when we look at Isaiah 5. What literary genre is that? Say that. Say that. I'm still tripping off the scripture. You kind of just like try to jump from. And, uh, no, I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't jump for anything. That's what no, you said. No, I'm still tripping off because it's, it's not questions. really saying what you're saying. So I'm asking I'm you a see. question right now. Right, right, you, right, right. But I'm, I'm still what because I'm still reading the scripture that you just read. This didn't say nothing that you was talking about. Which so which scripture you, is that, sir? That uh, the one that was uh, Proverbs fifteen and eleven, right? So what you mean? I I, yeah, I read it, it. It says hell and destruction are before the Lord. Correct. How much more than the hearts of the children of man? It says a scorn of love of not that. The, no, 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 no. See the on, thing about me, Proverbs. Wait, 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 wait. Slow down, my brother. The reason why I selected this because if you read a verse after and before, it does not give context to the verse I just gave you. That's one unique feature. Right, hold on, hold on, bro. Because if you read down, there's other statements pertaining to the heart that is uh you might want to read. No, I'm, I'm familiar with that. I didn't yeah. I didn't ask you it to exegete it because if so, I would have asked you to exegete it within the entire chapter. I just simply ask you a question and use it as a launch pad to get into the statements that I wanted to make. You, you was doing the same thing with a couple of single verses that you were singling out as well. Right, but what you're doing is it still don't hurt my position because if you look at no, the no, I'm not trying to hurt your position. No, I know it's not. No, I'm just saying like I don't know what. Listen, you this this text that you brought out right here is not what you just said. So so basically, what it's saying is how much more than the hearts of the children of man. 
that still doesn't disprove the fact that God searches the hearts of the children of men and God searches to know. So therefore, by relationship and also by God looking on the hearts of the children of men, he knows that they continue to do evil. So here's the well, question. Is that in present tense, future or past? There we go. You said you said, is this in present tense, future? Yes, or past? That's, what I'm, I'm, that's exactly what I asked you, yep. my brother. You said this text right here. No, I'm asking you, is this in present, future or past tense? This text 11, right? Yes, sir. It says hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of man? You see where it says hell and destruction are? That's what I'm asking you. Is that's, this in right there? That's that would be present tense. So 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 what is a state of verb, my brother? A state of verb. If we was to say something's a state of verb, what does that mean? Does that mean it's limited to time, future, past, and present? Well, it's kind of hard when you're dealing with Hebrew because biblical Hebrew, because as stated before, it's not like modern Hebrew. But at the same time, it could be where to where most things are is not looked for from a past tense. Uh, but more so, it could be it's kind of weird because. you. Well, have well, well, OK, so you know what? I, I'll, I'll leave that. The reason why I was saying this is because it's going to lead into the thing I was following up because you keep saying that people are running from Isaiah five. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to lay a concept on the table that I also uh, used to correlate with that, the book of Daniel, which I didn't even get into that scripture yet, and even a book of Ezekiel, right? Understanding when something is open before the most high, what does that mean? When something is bare, something is open, right? Something is presented, right? So if, if we're going to look at it, let's say, for example, hey, look, the book is open, but I don't know what's in it unless I read for it. Now, that would probably be your argument, right? Like, hey, yeah, the book is open, but, you know, I got to search in the book to find what I'm looking for. Would you agree with that concept? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep. Okay. So, yeah. So, so, or could it mean open where everything is revealed that is in the book? Um, it doesn't, that's just because some, something is open. I mean, that it, it is revealed. I mean, I guess something is the contents are being revealed if it's open. That's all my brother. That's yeah. all I'm trying to say. See the difference yeah. between me and you. I'm not trying to do a catch you. Right. No, but like, I'm like, saying that in this text right here, that's not what the same sense. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. So why would he say hell and destruction is before the Lord? Because hell and destruction, as far as hell, hell is something that is unseen. Like, like for example, if we're talking about I make my bed in hell, below low, thou art there, right? Because it's something that we can't see, right? Sheol, we can't see that with our naked eye. So if it's laid bare and it's open and he can see it. How much more the hearts of man? It's not hidden from him. He can no, see that's it. Not, not what that's saying is right there in this text is the way of destruction. Because we look at it, it's, look, it's saying right here, it says, correction is grievous unto him that forsake of the way. And he that hate of reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. So reason why it's saying that hell and destruction are the pathway of hell and destruction are the place of the dead is before the Lord is because of basically these scorners people that scorn so then he says how much more than the hearts of the children of man that is so when open he, before him my brother why is it using sheol and abaddon why is it using these two words yeah but uh real quick uh divine what do you like the point that you're making what is it that you're saying by it being open does that still take away from the point that gcon's making fundamentally well it's not taken away from it i'm saying oh, it's an interpretative man. view right and that's why we have to define when something is open what does it mean is it open so you can search or is it open meaning it's laid bare meaning you don't have to search but you can see it because it's open I right see. so in other so words like, like, like for like example if my door is closed like if my door is closed right and i ask you hey tell me what my living room looks like well you'd have to open the door to see it right to be able to tell me okay this is what it looks like Right, but, but the doors but, open. But, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If the doors open, the contents therein is revealed. You can right, see so, it. So right. So so here's the thing, though. Right. So what you're saying is that uh, is it a book on a shelf? Right. You don't know exactly what's in the book, but it's free for you to go and access it and open it, or is it laid bare? Meaning that just by perceiving the book, you know everything that's in the book off the bat. There is and, no and, uh, uh, effort to search. Right. Excellent point. Cool. And, and, cool. and that's what I'm saying. That is the wedge that drives us on the opposite sides. And that's that's why we have to have a conversation about it. And I'm simply just pointing things out for consideration to lead up to the thing that I wanted to say, which is to address the scriptures that Wait, he said Ron that we're not addressing. Real Ooh. quick. Now, it says here, 
For man look of on the outward appearance, but the Lord look of on the heart. Where, where's here? Now, what now, verse now, are you reading at? This is this is First Samuel six and okay, seven. Now, the, reason, okay, now, the reason why I brought that out, brother, is because in the ancient Near East, especially when you start looking at Kemet, the Mayat is the one who judges the heart, right? Yeah, but that's after death. Hold on. I got you. So the reason why I'm bringing that out is, is because in this text, this is why it's saying the heart of man is before the Lord. You know why? Because he's the one that judges the heart or look of on the heart. He searches the heart. So yeah, that's but why in, that, wait, wait, in that verse, it doesn't say search. It says he sees it, meaning it's revealed to him. That's the right, difference right. to us. Wait, to us. The, same way hell flesh, is revealed to the heart is not open. The heart is not revealed to us. But to Yah, it's open. He sees it. It's not hidden. Right. So, so I don't think, so listen, bro, I don't think you're looking at the whole entirety of the context of that text in, in, in uh, Proverbs. Because what he's saying is this, and he's saying it many of times. When you look at the text, the text is basically demonstrating concerning man, hell and, and, and destruction or the pathway of destruction is before the Lord, right? And you look at it when he says the heart of man is before him. The reason why the heart of man is before him is because he's the one that's weighing out or judging the heart. That's why he judges yeah, the heart. I, 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 but what I'm saying, I hear what you're saying, and I don't disagree. Of course, that's how judgment is done. I'm simply saying that that data that you just said is not there in the passage. For example, if you go to the TSK, right, the Treasury of Scriptural Knowledge, to show you a corresponding scripture, you get to Psalm 44, right? Psalm 44, verses 20 to 22, has it's a redemptive psalm, right? And it says in verse 20, if we have forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered since he knows the secrets of the heart? A secret is something that is hidden, right or wrong? Right. And so the scripture says that how God knows the secrets of the heart because he searches the secrets of the heart, the Bible so, says. So wait, wait, wait. Now, now let's slow down for a second, right? So if the secret, if something is secret, it means it's hidden, right? Meaning from who? Who is it hidden from? Who is the secret right. hidden from in this context? So, so, so man the, or the deity? Right. So the, so the perspective there um, could be the man, right? When it says the secrets of the heart, it's from his perspective that this is secret because he don't know. The man doesn't know, right? Man doesn't know. Right. But from God's perspective, it's known or he can know because it's right there. Bear before exactly. Or something he has to search. But, so, 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 um, so, G-Con. Um, hold on, hold on. Hey, Kevin, did I'm you, sorry. Did you, hey, Kevin. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, so here's the thing we have to consider, though. How do we reconcile verses such as Romans 8 and 27, right? It's he that searches the hearts and knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes an intercession for the saints according to the will of God, right? So, in this aspect, he's talking about the spirit, knowing man by he that searches the heart. And this is a common theme we see throughout the scripture. So what we need to define is what does it mean when God searches the heart? What does that mean? So let me put it to you like let me put it to you like this. You said he is the spirit. He knows it. Yeah, he that searches the heart. We've established that that's the father. Even we see even in Samuel one and five, where he says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee before thou camest forth out of the womb. I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. He did all this before he was born. He because the father knows and he sees the heart, just like I have knowledge that I like we look at it like this. We'll say that the father, son and the spirit work together like my mouth, my stomach and my throat. My mouth, stomach and throat serve different functions, but my stomach knows that food is coming its way because it comes out of my mouth. The stomach doesn't get to decide what food comes in me as the person as I do does. But my stomach works in conjunction with me and it, it ratifies essentially my will. That's essentially what he's saying well, there, there in that in that verse. Uh, the scripture is moving according to the will of the father and moving according to the heart that he is giving him that information. It's kind of like a database well, when you well, have a, a query. The query is searching for the, the information in the database. And based on that information in the database, it's the query. That does the work. The yeah, database. Wait, wait, big red. So that's, that's like you knowing what's in the database, but you're running the query to extract the data and put it front and center. Exactly. Right, that doesn't work. No, 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 but that doesn't work. You see why divine is showing that it does not work. Here's why. If you knew, let's say you looked up a database, you ran a query, right? Let's say you ran a SQL query. You're looking up the query to find out. You're not looking up the query because you know. Well, that's not always true. That's not if I, if I have a table in there and a SQL, if I have a SQL server, full oh, SQL server running, and I have check it out, I have tables in there with data that I put in there, 
right? Uh -huh. I know I put the data, wait, hold on. I know I put the data in there, but I may do a query search just to extract the data. Maybe I want to order the data, right? right? Maybe I want to do something to manipulate the data, yeah, or maybe I, I want to create a time. Divine, I understand that, but you're you're doing that from the perspective of your finite understanding, right? You can forget things, right? Let's say if you had a database of 100 users, or you have a database with 500 users, right? There's no way that you can collectively know these things because of your limited ability. That's why you have the database in the first place. That's the purpose well, that, of That's it. me and you, so, though. But what about the well, divine? Correct. Right, that's the point that I'm making here, right? So that's why I said his example uh, would not be like God is filing this in some place so that he could recall it anytime he want. His ability, as is described so far from you guys, is that he does not need this attribute because all things are already known by him in his mind. So, for example, if I had no, no, so, so wait, wait, I hear what you're saying, you're saying but that's not my position. Had, that's not my no, position. I, okay. I know it's not the position. You got to let me finish, bro. No, what I was saying was well, exactly what I said. Because he knows it's there, when there's a test or an action that is in the present moment, is brought to the surface, and that's why we talk about the test being rendered. Correct. Right. So, so the right, test, right, so the that, test is the right. query to Correct. bring what he already knows is there, so that way it could be right. recorded. Correct. So that way generations no, to come no. can understand and learn right. from that. Right, right. No, that's 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 the point. We're talking about okay, look, look, bro. It was bad to bring up databases in the first place. The reason for databases, okay. We're we're all in technical field here. It sounds like the grad is too, right? So the, the point of having a database is so that anything that's calling or making a query against the tables can recollect or bring up information in regards to what it is that's being all sought out. So if we're liking this to God. We're still invoking the attribute in which he needs to go look for something in order to recall something, which is a bad analogy, especially on the part of what you're saying. It, it, it's you're saying it's gonna, it's gonna work in your favor of the analogy, well, right? Well, no, no, it's not. But well, what, I, what I would say is that a better analogy will be like, um, I'm, I'm gonna say this, Superman, right? Uh, he has the ability to see through things and see what's in someone's pocket, which may be perceived as a secret to you because you can't see through a man. But he has the ability to see through a man. But does the scripture invoke the will or the action of him searching it out? It does. We have to admit this. Right? Yeah, but what is? Yeah, no, I agree. But what's the purpose of the searching out? Well, That's to get the information they're asking for. When God is searching out, He's looking for the information, it. requiring for the it. individual to give up something that God already knows is there. That's right. what it means. He's searching well, for that you go. to get well, something right. from the individual to give up something. That individual has to give up something that God already knows is there. It's that's not, what it means, that's, searching that's, the heart. That's, that's, that's not, and see, that's what I'm saying. What y'all are doing is this. What y'all are doing is, is not saying that in the text. <laughs> inquiry. Hold on, I got it. I got it. Inquiry. Hold on, hold on, brother. And the text is not there. So now you, now you out of the text. Now, for instance, we talked about Isaiah 5, right? Now, if I say that I'm Wait, can, I, can, can we deal with that? Because oh, 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 oh. hey, hey, yeah, he said yeah, we, what, one, anchor is in the text. No, anchor no, is in the t Romans 8 and listen, 27. No. The word I, anchor uh, is there for certain. Hold on, hold on, listen, bro, stop. stop. Who, was the last who was the last person needed to complete the statement? I, I, I need to complete the statement. That's, what I, that's why I brought out Isaiah 5. And I brought out Isaiah 5 for a reason, because what I was showing is, in the text, it says God is, he put, he made this vineyard, and he expected it or looked for it to bring forth something. Now, my question, as I stated before, you don't do you do any one of you expect for something to take place if you have this knowledge? It is not. What am I expecting for? There's no need for me to expect. And this in the text is saying that God, he says, he says, uh, judge you between me and you between my band. He said, where, did, where I look for it to bring forth something. It didn't. So he's saying that, listen, I'm looking for this to bring forth. And even, he even said in other scriptures, I stretch forth my hand, right, all day long to a gang stand people and what he thought and the great thoughts that he had for these people. And he says, I did this, that it might be they might do this or they might do that. Damn, man, like, is y'all really reading these scriptures? So, so Deacon, let me let me let me answer let me answer to that. So here, here we go. I asked you a question about Isaiah five. You didn't address it. I said, what is the literary genre of Isaiah five? Because Wait, this divine, has everything divine. to do about what we're what we're about to get into right now. What is the literary divine, genre? Divine. Is it is it a song? Is it prose? Is it poetry? What is it? 
Wait, Divine, let me please let me jump in right quick because I want to respond to, to um Kevin G when he said Romans 8 and 26. The word search, it does use inquiry. So we're using it and we're applying it right. He keeps saying that we're not. And that's the scripture he took us to. Right. So what what is in, what does inquiry mean? Okay, let's look it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's an act of don't, asking don't for an act of asking for information. This oh, information. Wow. That's what it's saying. Right, it's right, something right. that is yeah. already there that when God begins to search the heart of a person, he's right. asking for information that he knows is already there. That no, no, person no, no, has no, to no. give that. No. Kevin, let me let me no, let no, me no, say no, my listen, point. Listen, listen, listen. I asked you a question. I said, could you define inquiry? You said the act of asking for information now. Do you know what uses that root word in Latin is also for the word investigation, which means that inquiry actually means to find out that which you do not know. I rest my case. Well, here, I see how you're trying to play that. <laughs> I see exactly how you're trying to play that. That was a good point. That was a good point, Kevin. I see that. I got to go. That was good. Yeah, but G-Con is not going to get, 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 get away when I ask him this question. So, G-Con, check it. The literary genre of Isaiah 5 is what, my brother? Um, It's uh. Just read the first verse. Read the first verse. All right, so let's look at. It. I think it's poetic and liter and then literal, too, and it's good, but it's conveying a message. No, no, but but read it. What what does the first verse say? It says, um, "Hold on, hold on, let me go to it." Now I will sing to my well beloved a song. My well beloved touching his vineyard. My well beloved have a vineyard. Oh, now, now slow down there. If you go into any, I would say. Modern translation of the Bible, right? For people who may not know the Hebrew, right? I'm gonna keep it very basic. Anytime you look at a text, like for example, I'm looking at the NIV, right? NIV does a great job with this. If you go to Isaiah chapter four and you read it and you look to see how it's formatted, it's formatted like a whole paragraph. There's no breaks in between. When you go to Isaiah five, there's breaks in between. The reason why it's doing that is because it's showing you there's a shift in the literary genre about of, of what you're about to read. This is not meant to be literal. He is using an example of something that occurs in the earth to explain his supernatural actions. That doesn't mean when he's when he, when you read verse four, that doesn't mean he's literally saying, I'm, I'm looking for these grapes that, that should be there. They're not there. He this is what happens in the natural realm when you are husbandmen and you plant vineyards. So let me let me let me ask you a question. In ancient times, when they cultivated grapes. What did they do to the vines? Well, hold on real quick. Uh, now, I would accept that, but there's other texts that go, that, that kind of tells you. No, that no, this no, no. Let's stay here in Isaiah, my brother. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not going to go to the other texts. Hold on, listen. I'm not going to go, but I would accept that what you said, but then okay. I have to look at other texts that says stuff like, um, it says that he Israel is a tree that has not brought forth fruit. So there's there. So so what you're dealing with is a is a a type or shadow of an anthropomorphism, but it's conveying a message. Well, we well, wait, 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 wait. So we 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 get into the same page. So I hold guess. on. So hold on. So what I'm saying is this: is the 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 messenger of what's being conveyed here is is that and, and, and take in mind that we find already that we just seen the guy searches the heart or he investigates. So what we find is this is. Is that these fellows right here, as even with New Testament passages, are found to be doing uh, not to be fruitful and not to be bringing forth fruit. So this is literal right here. It's using Israel basically as a vineyard that's bringing forth the allegory, uh, a grape, yes. using for wild, yeah, allegory that's bringing forth wild grapes, and God it didn't expect them to do that. Now no, when no, no, said no, wait, 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 wait. So so just read read verse seven. The vineyard. Of the Most High is the nation of Israel, and the people uh, uh, is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in, and he looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed. This is the key thing. He looked for justice and saw bloodshed. Why? Because at this stage they was in a denigrative state, right? They were declining. This is why the prophet Isaiah was raised up to speak to them, even though they would be deaf, uh, dumb, and blind, right? And it says for righteousness but heard cries of distress. And then the next verse goes on and says, because of that, he's going to judge. 
Now, this is not a particular passage. This doesn't about help any... your position, brother. It actually confirms my position because wait, why wait, 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 wait. But, but let me, you, you didn't even know what I was going to say. I was expecting you just something. Go ahead. I'm going to mute my mic. No, no, you good, G-Con. I was just simply saying is if you look at this passage where he's saying that he's looking for justice but finds bloodshed, the question I was going to ask wasn't in disagreement with your position. It's simply saying is that when we're looking at that particular context, is this a limitation of his foreknowledge or is it just showing something that is happening there in the moment that requires him to judge? Yes, he expected Israel to be righteous, right? He gave them the statute of laws and commandments, right? As a collective, they did not follow that. I believe, I agree, I'm not going to say believe, but I agree that covenants are conditional and it requires both parties for the most part, right? So when Israel breaks their part of the covenant, right, there are consequences. Just like when you brought up earlier, I think it was you or Kevin, or Kevin brought it up about Deuteronomy 28 that Israelites use all the time and wanted to show things were conditional, right? That relationship is conditional, meaning that it's contingent upon the other party's actions will drive the most high to do what he does, right? Yes, so yes, in sir. this case, because Israel had slipped, they slipped into a decline and he was looking for justice and he only found bloodshed. I'm asking you from this passage in this context, is this, does this mean it's a limitation of his foreknowledge? Or is he just bringing to the forefront something in particular to explain why they're about to be judged? Right. Uh, to me, I see in this text uh, that there is um, some knowledge that is limited in the sense of because, as I stated before, um, those, there are things that cannot be known. And, and the reason why I would say that is, is because when you look to this text, it's other texts that show you that God has been expecting something just like if he, he expected something from the people that was uh in genesis 6 from people did they're just not meeting the standards god has expected from these people to do certain things for the longest to where god had to take it into his own hands and start doing certain things because his messengers are not meeting the standards so wait, wait so this is there with genesis 6 right so here's the question when adam and eve was in the garden before the nakash or the snake got involved right um, was Adam and Eve obedient for the most part from what we can assume? That's what it says in the Bible. No, no, but I'm asking, can we safely assume that they were obedient up until they were tested by the snake? It says God saw that it was good, so I would say. Yes. So you say yes, right? Yeah. Okay. So now when they are found to be disobedient and they are put outside of the garden, what is the anticipation of the most high? First of all, the first example of that is Cain and Abel, right? He has a whole conversation with Cain, Genesis chapter four. He says, sin is crouching at your door. Sin offering is also another word for sin offering. He says, but what is, what is, what is the expectation from Cain? Because he's having a conversation with him now to get Cain to see something that he already knows, but he's getting Cain to see it. Let's go to, let's get Genesis chapter four. Hey, but yeah, you know what? Uh, I want to talk to you about this, Ron Shields. I do. Uh, I know you're a good brother to talk about this, too. You too. Uh, uh, I ain't got to get worried about getting blocked or thrown off or, you know, just snap, but I definitely do got to land out the window. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. My head you should not, my brother. You should not. Like, I welcome conversations. Like, I don't use words like heretic. I don't use words like heathen. I don't, I don't do stuff like that because all that does... It's just me distancing myself from understanding your perspective, right? Because you may be onto something and simply because of my pride and not yielding to a conversation, um, I'm afraid that I may be wrong. I'm not. I, everything that you and Kevin was bringing out, I see that you have a very distinct position in the open theism. Because, you know, open theism is not monolithic, right? There's various nuances to it that some people accept, some people don't accept. Matter of fact, the book that I share with Sister E in a group on Facebook, I can send it to you and Kevin G. I have, like I said, I have about six, seven books on this. Yeah, send and that book. Send that book to me, definitely. Yeah, but definitely. I matter of fact, I got papers with, uh, from uh, Clark uh, Hinnock, uh, which is one of the pioneers of the thought form, and even his response to criticisms, which will help help you submit your position. Actually, he makes some good points. Right. Um, but the point I was trying to make is in Genesis four, and and again, you know, I'm gonna leave soon to G Kong, because then I got to get some sleep, man. But I, I like speaking with you and Kevin because you guys are open minded. Um, I, I, I like how you do. Uh, you take little shots, but not personal. You take shots to kind of uh, egg on the conversation. And, and I appreciate that. Right. Um, but in Genesis chapter four, 
we have a situation where the Most High speaking to Cain, and there is an it already the Most High knows what is going to happen. So let's read it. Genesis chapter four, and let's go to verse. Um, go to verse. Uh, verse four. You have you still have your Bible, uh, G Con, and I'm gonna end off with this because I gotta go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so go to Genesis chapter four and read verse four. Hold on. Genesis 4 and 4. It says, And Abel, he also brought up the first of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect to Abel, but uh, unto Abel and to his offering. But Cain, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Okay, so wait, so so there's an acknowledgement of an emotion that Cain is possessing, right? Okay, go ahead. So he said, I'm sorry, why art thou wrong? And why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well. Well, wait, wait, wait. So now he's presenting to him, what did you say? Life or death, right? He's presenting to him two options, right? And go ahead, keep reading. If thou doest well, should thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin live at the door. And what is and what does what will sin do? Uh, sin like sin is crouching at the door, and to thee shall be his desire, uh -huh. and that's the rule over him. Now, so so now here's a conversation where the Most High is laying out before Cain options. Now, how does he know these things are possible when it's just Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve? Are you saying it's because of his experience with Adam and Eve in the garden? That's how he knows this to to share this knowledge with Cain. Well, actually, he experienced it with his father. Who? You know, uh, whoa, 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 wait, 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 what? He experienced it with Adam. And who, he. Who? No, no, that. So th did you hear the question I asked you? I asked you two questions. I said, how did he know this? Did he know it by having experience with Adam and Eve? And that's how he's able to know it in advance. Right. Or is it because he already has foreknowledge of his creation? If I create a product, I know what it's supposed to do. And I know the options that I give it to do based on a scenario. Right? Yeah, so, so as I stated before, Go ahead. he knows because he has experience um, through his father. And also before his father, he experienced it through the fallen ones, that what they're capable of doing. That's why he gave him the option. And he actually told him, he said, if thou doest well, uh, sh uh, he said, if thou doest well, should thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin is live at the door. So, in order for him to, he would have had to know to be, to do to to know what well is, in order for him to do well. So the Bible says, "Faith come by hearing and hearing of the word." So he would have had to know, in order to do well, to be accepted by God. And God so, told so, him. so so God's experiential knowledge is based upon actual experience. Yeah, uh, yeah, there is a like a human, like a human being. That's now, do human clearly, beings wait, wait? So, do human beings have instincts? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, if human beings have instincts, um, how does that differ from experience? Right. So, this this what I'm saying. When you say experiential knowledge, that is just what it is. It means that you're going through the experience. You gain the ex knowledge by the experience that you go through. That's what that's talking about. There's no way you can sidestep that. No, it's all good. My, I, I have to. I'm gonna go. My daughter just woke up. I gotta see what's going on. So, I, I, I want to pause it there. And um, next time me and you speak, G Con, let's pick it up from there. And I think we can have a very healthy conversation into this because it, it's going good. Because we're able to build, people are able to listen. And I think if we have more conversations like this, people will better be able to see both positions. Uh, like likewise, brother. Grace of peace, man. Love y'all, man. Same to you, man.